Okay, hello UK class. Uh, so today we're going to go ahead and uh, talk about another big uh, discovery made by largely, uh, at least uh, for, for a part of it, um, British scientists. So we already talked about evolution, how that was very much a you know, British discovery. Uh, this one we're going to be going to a few other places. You know, we could start out in the Netherlands and uh, go to the UK for a bit head to Germany, go back to the UK, head to the United States. You know, there's definitely contributions by some Italians in here too. Um, but uh, we have some major, major discoveries that are largely the result of the work of some British uh, people. So uh, we'll have at least two big names uh, to get into today. And also <clears throat> uh, to go along with my lecture, um, which hopefully won't be terribly long, there is a, a video by Ian Stewart to watch called Men of Rock Moving Mountains. So that'll be your assignment is to watch this, watch that, and um, we'll go ahead and have a discussion over that too, because as you could tell from your uh, book, Reading the Rocks, which by the way, everyone's doing a good job putting in some good um, uh, discussions there. This is about Victorian scientists, right? So we're getting past that point. We're dealing with now getting into the late 1800s uh, through the 1960s and well into the 70s. Um, so we're getting past, you know, so we're getting into more modern times, more recent discoveries, and uh, so our book isn't really going to help us with that, but that video by Ian Stewart will really help, as well as uh, this lecture. So um, I guess uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, this is a uh, uh, pretty much the first major reasonably accurate uh, textbook on geology by a uh, British, uh, British guy, Arthur Holmes. So we'll be talking about him quite a bit. But as we start talking about the discovery of plate tectonics, beginning with ideas of continental drift, we need to start a little bit before Arthur Holmes. So um, first, uh, this is a guy that we talked about earlier in the semester where we had kind of that who's who list of uh, famous famous British uh, and Scottish people, um, Sir, Sir Charles Wyville Thompson. Um, so he was a, a really brilliant guy. Uh, and one of the things that he was doing was something that I didn't think they were even doing in the 1800s. They were actually starting to map the ocean floor. So this is a major um, uh, expedition called the HMS Challenger uh, Expeditions. So uh, it was really cool. I just pulled up Wikipedia and started reading about the Challenger Expeditions. And there's several different Challengers, as we'll see, but all of them, including the NASA uh, Space Shuttle, um, were named after the HMS Challenger. So this uh, we have here revolutionized oceanography and there's a, a link here to read more about that. Um, this expedition though pretty much invented oceanography and uh, put it on the map as far as a serious pursuit of science that you know it was thought for a long time that we would never be able to find out what's at the bottom of the sea floor. It's probably just all flat sediment. There's species down there that um, you know, uh, probably, you know, um, hadn't evolved very much. So we're going to discover a whole bunch of brand new things that we've never seen before. Uh, so there were all these ideas um, about the deep sea because no one had really seen them. Well, the HMS Challenger expeditions were the first time, the first opportunity to really see what's down there. So um, uh, Thompson was primarily a, a biologist, so he was mostly interested in collecting specimens and seeing what kind of life is in uh, the deep sea. Um, but at the same time, he was also taking some really detailed, for at the time, some really detailed measurements of the sea floor and using that to figure, you know, to find things like rigid mountain systems and even uh, ridges. So uh, that'll, uh, those ridges will be a big factor a little bit later. So this is a, um, a drawing of the HMS Challenger. This was a, uh, a you know, ship owned by the Royal Navy. And um, because Thompson was really interested in the biology of the oceans and wanted to, you know, see what kind of life is down there, uh, the Navy agreed he could have it and uh, change it over into a science vessel. So uh, most of the guns were removed, so these huge guns on the sides, uh, to make room for uh, labs. And um, one of the things they did that you'll see in uh, Ian Stewart's video um, called Men of Rock, Moving Mountains, and I'll put that link along with this uh, PowerPoint, is um, actually doing this activity where you throw a lead weight over the, uh, the side of the ship, 
and you have all this line. It was over 800 miles of Italian hemp that they used. So you have all this rope and you're dumping it off. I'm sorry, not 800 miles, 181 miles of line. Sorry, I just read that and messed up. Um, and so you, you uh, just kept letting the line go until it hits the bottom of the sea, you know, miles deep. Um, and then you pull it up and you have to, uh, you know, count all the fathoms or whatever uh, as you're pulling it up. Um, and then once you do that, you have to do it a whole bunch more times because that's just one measurement of the depth of the sea in that one spot. Um, so that's how they did this. Um, they didn't have sonar back then. We'll talk about another challenger that, that develops that. Um, but they used this line for dredging and for um, um, measuring as well as they could. Um, so one of the things that they did discover, though, and this was pretty cool because, you know, we're talking about 1870s here. Um, this is shortly after Darwin published on the origin of species. So ideas of evolution and natural selection are becoming very hot with the scientific community. So they're starting to think about, OK, what if the seafloor has just kind of this ooze that is somewhere between the boundary of um, of uh, chemicals and actual organic life. So that was kind of one of the, uh, the ideas that um, proponents of evolution were thinking. Um, however, the ships, the, the, the Challenger did not find anything like that. So that kind of set evolution back a little bit, of course. Now we know that that's not how life began and you know the bottom of the sea isn't necessarily the best uh, place for that, or at least not in that way. Um, but they did discover a whole bunch of new species, though not any more than you would expect if you went into a brand new rainforest or something. Or something. So that did um, benefit proponents of evolution that, yeah, all these things that we think of as extinct or primitive, the ocean just isn't full of that stuff. Uh, these fish are pretty um, advanced, you know, pretty derived uh, organisms uh, with their own special bizarre uh, anatomies. They're not necessarily ancestral or primitive types of things. We're not finding trilobites in the deep sea is kind of the, the thing. Um, so that was actually pretty helpful to ideas of evolution. So um, a lot of the marine life that we may see in documentaries today, like uh, angler fish, this deep sea angler fish over here, of which there are many, many species. Uh, a couple were listed here. And this other guy caught a stargazer. Um, things like the gulper eel, um, uh, flashlight fish, all sorts of things like that are found in the deep sea. Oh, and not to mention mollusks, you know, like uh, all sorts of octopus. Uh, uh, octopus and squids, echinoderms from actually dredging the seafloor itself, um, all sorts of life. So really adding to the knowledge of marine life during this time, which was uh, pretty cool. And still, every time we take a trip down to the deep sea or collect anything from the deep sea, we find new species all the time. So there's still a treasure trove of new things to find. But again, they're not ancestral or ancient things. They're not trilobites. They're you know, just as derived as anything on land. Um, so this, these expeditions were considered um, the, what we would consider the greatest advance in knowledge of Earth since the big, mostly physics and chemistry based discoveries of the 15th and 16th centuries, including things like the Earth revolves around the sun and other very big ideas that are now central to our understanding of our world. Um, this the, the, this expedition um, kind of added to that quite a bit and some huge uh, huge discoveries. Uh, so here is the path of the expedition. So they started out here uh, from Portsmouth, and uh, which is one of the sites we were going to visit on our trip, and we will um, you know, of course hopefully visit uh, next spring. Um, and uh, headed. Um, Okay. Well, part of the uh, place, well, one of the places that they went to was the Mediterranean. So they actually spent some time in the Mediterranean and pulled up some really cool uh, minerals like anhydrite and gypsum from the seafloor in the Mediterranean, which allowed people to begin to realize that uh, the Mediterranean had once been dry and had been covered over by the ocean. It's dried out, you know, and so on. So we start to see evidence of that. Um, and they head down into South America, um, head over into the um, Indian Ocean. So we're covering a lot of land here, all the way through the Philippines, where they, um, one of the 
well, several of the measurements they make uh, begin to uh, head down into the Mariana Trench, the deepest spot in the ocean. So they're starting to discover that sort of thing. Uh, up through Japan, uh, through the middle of the Pacific, and uh, hitting the Hawaii back to South America, and then making their way up the west coast of Africa and back to uh, Europe. So um, they hit uh, a lot of major places uh, in the world um, and made it pretty close to Antarctica, but not quite within sight of Antarctica. Okay, so big expedition for 1870s. Um, so when, once the uh, Challenger came back, uh, Thompson then published two volumes of uh, Voyer, Voyager, Voyage of the Challenger in the Atlantic, um, but wanted to publish 50 volumes because that was just the Atlantic. He wanted to cover so much more of the world that, he, uh, that, that they uh, explored, um, but it was just too stressful. Uh, he couldn't get it done, and unfortunately he died in 1882. Uh, the Wyville Thompson Ridge in the North Atlantic Ocean, uh, right up here, uh, north of Scotland, uh, between Scotland and the Faroe Islands, is named after him. And this is uh, one small part of a ridge uh, that is a much, much bigger system that he was beginning to figure out. So over here in red, we have, um, that's not the Wyville Thompson Ridge, that's south of it. In fact, we don't even really have uh, the British Isles on this map. But uh, you can see a nice, and this would have been developed in the 50s, actually, 1950s, so we'll deal with that later, um, a pretty detailed map of the Atlantic. So we can see that Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the Wyville Thompson Ridge is one small part of that, but what he really didn't know, um, but was start, they were starting to make sense of, was that this is a much smaller uh, connection of a much bigger ridge system that is uh, kind of global, um, or it was thought to be global as it connects into uh, the Pacific as well. So this is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and the, uh, this expedition began to discover that and make sense of what that means to have a huge, not just mountains, but a big ridge system, which is a whole row of huge mountains coming up about halfway to the surface of the sea in the middle of the Atlantic. Well, what does that mean? I'll revisit that. Um, so uh, a little bit about Thompson's legacy and mostly the legacy of the Challenger. There's a lot of things named after the Challenger, including the deepest point in the oceans called Challenger Deep. And uh, you can click on this link and it uh, brings you to a popular mechanics um, uh, article that talks about James Cameron's uh, very famous dive uh, a few years ago. Um, he's the what, the director of uh, Titanic and stuff and was one of the explorers that uh, helped to locate the Titanic because for a very long time, I think through until the 70s, maybe that's when he found it, 80s, um, we didn't really know where the Titanic was. It's in very, very deep, very cold water, very hard to... Um, explore there in the North Atlantic, but he's he was one of the ones on the team that discovered the Titanic, actually located it. <clears throat> um, but he also uh, specially built a uh, device that would allow him to get just one person, which is pretty unusual, uh, allow him to go down into Challenger Deep, the deepest part of the Mariana Trench. Um, and, you know, uh, this was really cool when it was happening a few years ago as I was beginning to uh, get my scuba diving training because it turns out to get to the Challenger Deep, um, obviously you're limited by how much air you could take with you, right? How much oxygen. Um, and the big problem is getting it down there and then uh, planning to come back fast enough to even make it worthwhile. Uh, otherwise, you're just shooting down there, maybe for a few seconds, then you have to come back up. But if you want to do any exploration, you need to shorten the time it takes to get to the deepest part of the trench and back from the deepest part of the trench. So his device is very different than if you've seen Alvin or uh, Jacques Cousteau's um, you know, diving um, uh, I can't remember what Cousteau's, the, the name of that one is, or something called the Trist uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, anyway, these were all deep sea diving uh, vessels too, but James Cameron's was kind of like a tube that would just shoot right down to the water very, very quickly, all the way down to the trench and be able to surface uh, quickly too. Thereby, he was able to spend, I think, 40 minutes uh, in, the, in the trench, which is huge. Um, 
Okay, anyway, so uh, you can read about that in this image, which I know you can't see very much of, not just because I'm covering it, but also because it's very long and tall. Um, you can blow that up and see that the deepest part of the Mariana Trench, the Challenger Deep, is deeper than Mount Everest. So this white kind of triangle here uh, is showing you the outline of Mount Everest, and we're much deeper than that. So that kind of gives you a sense of how deep this area is. And uh, you also have some of the deepest ranges of things like sperm whales, uh, elephant seal, and uh, some other uh, deep sea submersibles and stuff like that. So a lot of really cool information about that spot. And it's off the coast of Guam. So going back to our, well, I can't go back to the map, won't let me, um, but we're um, off the coast of the Marianas Islands in the Pacific, south of Japan, but along the, uh, the Asian um, continent. Um, some other things, and we'll talk about this one too, the Glomar Challenger. Uh, Glomar is a shortened form of Global Marine, which is uh, the company that built this. Um, this is a deep sea research and scientific drilling vessel, vessel that we'll talk about later that did a lot of major exploration through the 70s and into the 80s uh, that would help us understand what's actually happening in the deep sea. And then a little less successful, I suppose, um, is uh, uh, the NASA Space Shuttle uh, Challenger, uh, which, of course, is, as you uh, probably know, um, exploded upon, um, um, you know, it, uh, as it was, not as it was launched, but when it was up in the air. 86, I think. I remember being a kid and seeing it uh, live because uh, we gathered to the cafeteria to watch uh, this space shuttle because the 70s, 80s, you know, we're just kind of feeding off of the excitement of the uh, space race from the 60s. So the 80s, man, these space shuttles, they were just, you know, uh, very, very cool. And, you know, kids back then were just fascinated by this stuff. So we gathered in the cafeteria to watch the uh, space shuttle launch and um, things were going well for a while. And then it was uh, kind of shocking. It, it just all exploded. Um, just no one really knew why. And there's uh, been a lot of stuff figuring out why. And now we have a better idea. But anyway, so, um, but, you know, Challenger, the HMS Challenger then lends its names. It lends its name to a lot of uh, really cool things, one of which the Glomar Challenger will be focusing on in a bit. Okay, so we're starting to map out the seafloor, starting to see a few, uh, you know, neat things going on down there. Um, but, you know, science does not happen in a bubble. And uh, one of the things that I had difficulty with as I'm pulling this information together for you is that, okay, well, this guy said this in 1958, but this guy said like the same thing in like 54. Did he come up with it first? Well, probably, but did, were they talking to each other? Well, maybe, but, you know, are we just oversimplifying it? And, you know, everyone actually kind of worked as a team and they all had their own input, the details of which we may not really know. Uh, that's probably what's going on. Um, however, uh, a guy who really did kind of stand alone is uh, this, this fella, Alfred Wegener. So now we're heading over to Germany for a bit uh, to kind of put our story of British uh, exploration of plate tectonics in perspective, because we can't talk about that without talking about this German. So uh, there was, you know, uh, Thompson, there were other people, um, even back in the late 1500s, a guy named uh, Abraham Ortelius, uh, from the Netherlands uh, began to realize that it looks like North America and Europe and South America and Africa would fit pretty well together. In fact, if you close the Atlantic Ocean and squish those continents together, um, yeah, that's kind of cool. And Ortelius, Ortelius even suggested that maybe they had been separated by violent things like earthquakes and floods, which to people back then, uh, those are very violent things. Now we know that earthquakes are, well, floods are irrelevant when it comes to continental movement, but earthquakes at least are actually a result of much, something much, much, much bigger that's happening. They don't actually cause, uh, you know, uh, 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 plates to move. Um, so there were some ideas developing, but no one could really, no one was really piecing together all a whole bunch of information and coming up with a mechanism for how continents could move. Well, Wagner did the first part of that anyway. So he was able to um, use a whole bunch of evidence. We'll see some outlined in a little bit where <clears throat> uh, he proposed that there was a supercontinent uh, that he called Ur Continent. Um, but we refer to it as Pangea, which means all land or all earth, like a pan, 
pandemic. You know, when people say something's a global pandemic, that doesn't make sense because pan means all. So you're just saying global basically twice. So a pandemic, as you, you know, understand, is like all um, uh, disease or whatever. Like, a, a, uh, yeah, it'd be all disease. So it's like everywhere. Um, he, uh, Wagner, though, while he was piecing together a lot of evidence, and here's a picture of Pangaea, so we have basically closed the Atlantic and squished those continents together. Uh, the problem was uh, he thought that maybe the uh, Earth's rotation might be strong enough to shift the continents around. Um, a physicist uh, kind of wrote a really scathing uh, uh, response uh, proving that centrifugal force could not do that. In fact, all the continents would just be kind of towards the equator if that was a big role. So that was kind of a big hit to Wagner's idea. Wagner also, though, speculated about seafloor spreading and thought that, you know, maybe the mid-ocean ridge has something to do with this. He didn't really have the evidence or the ability to really go much further with that idea. Never really published any more on it. But he was on the right track, as we know. So here's some, uh, some of Wegener's evidence. Um, uh, the, I like this because it just kind of outlines you know, the important stuff, especially related to the United Kingdom. So one of the things you'll see in the Ian Stewart video is um, geologists, going back to uh, Roderick Murchison, were, you know, really, uh, and, and Ben and Peach, or sorry, Ben Peach and uh, John Horn that we uh, talked about already, they were looking through rocks in the highlands of Scotland. And uh, one of the things that they found were trilobites in um, southwest Scotland are a lot of the same ones found in, um, in North America. Whereas if we go to England and some other southern parts of Scotland, the trilobites there are the same ones that are in the rest of Europe. Well, you guys know why, because we talked about the geology of the highlands already. It's because Scotland and England were actually uh, separated and then had been sw squashed together. And Scotland had more of a relationship with uh, uh, Canada and the northern part of um, the United States, whereas England had more of a relationship that was squished down there, is more related to the rest of Europe. So eventually those would collide together and form the British Isles as we know them. Um, but that's why the, uh, the trilobites were so different. But that was a mystery uh, to people. They had no idea why. Well, this idea of Wagner's, this idea that all the plates had, all the continents, I'm sorry, had once been together as Pangaea explained what's going on there. They're same, the same because these places had been attached and have since been divided. Um, he was also very much looking at fossils, so uh, he realized that things like Mesosaurus, uh, Cynognathus, Lystrosaurus, uh, a plant called Glossopterus, these are um, organisms that um, had very interesting ranges to him. If we have, you know, the Cynognathus, this land reptile, couldn't really swim, certainly not, a, not across a, the Atlantic Ocean. If it lived in South America and Africa, well, that, that's really weird. How could that connect it? And if it lived, in, if it can go all the way to Africa, why doesn't it go in North America? So these ranges really tied these continents together. Um, so we're looking at uh, fossils to try to link these together. He was, you know, Wagner was really on fossils, but he was a meteorologist, which is one of the reasons why his ideas, which were trying to explain to geologists, you know, why. Uh, fossils and everything are where they are, uh, were not taken, were not accepted very well because he wasn't even a geologist. But he was a meteorologist um, and actually proposed a lot of, uh, he, he's, he, he's one of the first to begin to figure out why tornadoes form. Um, he was, he, he was doing a lot of amazing stuff outside of just basically uh, coming up with our central unifying theory in all of geology. Um, but so he was coming up with a lot of things in his own field as well. A very brilliant guy. Okay, so he was interested in meteorology and climate. So he was uh, kind of the original paleoclimatologist trying to go back um, through ancient rocks and try to figure out, okay, what was the climate like in Kentucky, for instance, or in Germany during this time period? Um, so we have a map here of some very special rocks that show up in different parts of the world. Um, here in Kentucky, you know, I'll just kind of uh, get a red pen and kind of outline where we are. Oopsie, didn't mean to go to Morocco there, but uh, we have, you know, we have coal in Kentucky. 
Um, so we know that there used to be coal swamps. Those are things that today really only exist in tropical places, and for many reasons, coal doesn't really form anymore today anyway, but those tropical types of forests, tropical doesn't just mean warm and wet, it means along the equator, which are places that are warm and wet. Um, we have all this limestone from the deposition of reefs, which are also a tropical place. Uh, things like sand dunes and desert environments, like evaporite minerals, like a crust of salt or something like that. These are found in latitudes today that are about 30 degrees north and south away from the equator. So we have the equator about, zero, well, right at zero degrees um, latitude, and then the most most of the deserts of the world are at 30 degrees north and south, subtropics, and then we get into temperate zones, and then all the way to the poles, we get polar regions, right? So why they're called that, where we can have glaciers. So um, all these different zone, all these different ancient rocks uh, to, to Wagner of about the same age, and they all date to about the time Pangaea was together here, um, they made him think that, okay, either, you know, there used to be no rhyme or reason, no sense at all to ancient uh, climate zones on our planet, or the continents have moved. And of course, the explanation that makes more sense, though he couldn't really show how it happened, was that the continents had moved. So he uh, realized that India would have had to have been uh, very close to the South Pole and was because it was once covered by glaciers. So was Australia, you know, so these places were oriented around the South Pole and then places that experience uh, more desert environments are closer to the equator. Places that experience more tropical environments are right, were right on the equator and have since moved. So we can actually kind of outline where the ancient equator would have been a little bit um, and get an idea of what kind of things are happening here. So that's pretty cool. So here's actually a drawing from uh, Alfred Wegener's book where he tied all this together. And the cool thing is, is that once he was able to tie together the climatologic evidence, um, the fossil evidence, the fit of the continents, uh, things like different rocks, like where do we have a bunch of igneous rocks versus mountain building and all that. The cool thing is, is that all these pieces of evidence tied together and created basically the same map of Pangaea. It's not like the fossil evidence suggested the continents were like this and the climate evidence suggested the continents were like this in a totally different way. All these independent lines of evidence agreed and created a map of Pangaea, created the same map. And that's how he knew he was on the right track. Unfortunately, again, the problem is he couldn't describe how they formed uh, and physics, which has and is still today um, um, kind of the... You know, it, oh, well, geologists can say what they want, but if physicists decide that this is impossible, then, okay, it goes out the window. And that's exactly what happened with uh, Wegener's idea of continental drift. Physicists, physicists said it couldn't happen. It's the end of that. So, uh, Wegener uh, died on an expedition to Greenland and uh, never saw his ideas being uh, accepted and um, rejuvenated. Um, so, let's go back to England here. Arthur Holmes, uh, one of the most brilliant people we are talking about this semester, um, and also one of the last, most recent people we're talking about. Unfortunately, he died in 1969, uh, relatively young. He was only like a 63, uh, or sorry, he died in 65, I had the dates right there. He was, uh, 75, who was I? Oh, sorry, I was thinking about someone else. I was getting a little bit ahead. Okay, I was thinking about the American. Okay, back to Arthur Holmes. Um, <clears throat> so he made two major contributions to this uh, understanding of geology. Both of the big things he did are things that we teach in every geology class, 100 level, whatever. Um, so first of all, we'll talk about the one that's not quite so related to plate tectonics, and that is uh, understanding how radiometric dating of earth materials works, like minerals. So he was one of the first earth scientists to figure out, um, uh, you know, plate tectonics as well and how that could be driven. And we'll get into that more later. But first of all, a little bit about radiometric dating. And um, so <clears throat> we don't have to get into how radiometric dating works. I know we've got some geology majors, you guys probably have a good idea. But um, the point is, is that you're looking at the ratio between two different 
elements or two isotopes, um, you know, the same element perhaps. So um, as you start out, so basically you need to count pretty accurately, which takes some uh, pretty crazy equipment, um, how much of what you're starting with versus how much you're left with. So uh, for example, this image here is looking at what a rock would look like, like a meteorite or something that formed four and a half billion years ago, the same age as the earth. Um, <clears throat> when it was a baby, when this rock was brand new, it would have uh, you know, cooled from a melt. That's what starts this radiometric clock. It would have 100% uh, of the parent isotope. These are both two isotope, two different isotopes of uranium. And then zero, I'll just draw zero here, um, percent of the daughter isotopes, which in both of these cases, there are different isotopes of lead. So uranium-238 will decay over a time period that is known and understood to uh, lead 206. Uranium-235 will decay, also predictably and known, to a um, isotope uh, called lead 207. Um, and these numbers, don't worry about them, it's just the number of uh, uh, neutrons or whatever. But um, <clears throat> so that's how it starts, where we have 100% of the parent, 0% of the daughter. Uh, and then today, if, you know, we, when we find that rock that's four and a half billion years old, um, we have a certain amount of it has decayed. So some of that uranium-238 has changed over to the daughter, lead-206, and same thing with the uranium-235, but there's a lot less of uranium-235 left. This uh, is how we actually check, this is kind of a cross-check. This is how we know that the uh, half-life of uranium-235 is far smaller than the one for uranium-238, which, by the way, half of it's left. The half-life of uranium-238 to lead-206 is four and a half billion years. And there is about roughly 50-50 amounts of both the parent and daughter in um, meteorites and uh, some of the oldest rocks on Earth that are closer to 4.3, 4.4 billion years in age. Um, but what we want to do is not just use one iso one uh, DK pair, we want to try to use two. And that's why we count other isotopes too in the same sample. And, you know, uh, so anyway, all this tons and tons of information. Uh, Arthur Holmes is one of the first to uh, pull all this together um, and figure out how to date rocks. One of the first ones he dated was a Devonian rock uh, from Norway that uh, he was able to figure out was 370 million years old. So MA, when you see that, uh, that means milli annuum or millions of years. Whereas GA, if you see that means giga annuum or billions of years. So that's you know kind of shorthand for um, the time period there. Um, so this is 1911. 1913, he publishes a book where he's saying we should be using radioactive, uh, radiometric dating instead of, you know, and here we go, back to a physicist, Lord Kelvin, who famously came up with a number uh, for the age of the Earth based on the temperature of the Earth. And assuming it was all molten when it first formed and looking at the temperature of it now, um, you know, can we kind of extrapolate back and figure out uh, when the earth actually formed where it was all hot um all you know and we know you guys know now from reading your book that there's um uh some big difference you, know, you can't just do that uh but also um a big problem is kelvin didn't know anything about radioactivity ironically radioactivity was going to be what allows us to date the earth while it was what uh kind of messed up his methods. But he was a physicist, very well-known, very famous guy. Um, you know, he was the Lord, so, um, you know, everyone kind of listened to him. And so his estimate of less than 100 million years for the age of the Earth uh, stood for a very long time. So eventually, though, Holmes was able to uh, figure out in, in 1927, uh, from looking at some of the oldest rocks he could find, calculated the age of the Earth to about 3 billion years. 3,000 million is, um, you know, 3 billion. And uh, eventually got up to about 4.5 billion years, uh, plus or minus 100 million years or so, which is the accepted age of the Earth today, is about 4.563 billion years. Um, you know, so we're looking at uranium mostly uh, to lead. Now there are problems with using uranium to lead dating. Uh, 
um, that gets into a whole other class. Back to the United States in the 1960s and 70s with a guy named Claire Patterson. And that's a cool story, too. But that gets a little bit outside of what we need to deal with here. But the important thing that Arthur Holmes did for our story is um, he came up with how uh, continents could move. So he was one of the few people that took Alfred Wegener's ideas, written in, the, in 1915, and was... Be, you know, beginning to think, well, you know, I think there is a mechanism for how continents could move, and it's going to have to do with the oceans. Maybe there is heat down below the sea floor that's allowing all this stuff to actually move around. Um, he called this convection, and we know convection exists in, you know, all over the world. We wouldn't have storms if it wasn't for convection. Uh, we wouldn't have, you know, the, the reason why air conditioners are often at in the lower parts of a, of a house is because that, I'm sorry, that's not true. The heaters are often in the lower parts of a house because heat rises and will continue to warm up the house. Um, if you have a heater like in the top floor of the house and it's not going to go anywhere and it's certainly not going to drop down. So the fact that uh, warm things take up more space, therefore more voluminous, less mass, less density than um, the same amount of mass, less density, and so they rise, and the idea that cool material contracts and sinks back down, this is convection. And we see it in many things, you know, um, in many different uh, physical processes. So Holmes thought maybe it exists deep, deep, deep in the earth, way deeper than anyone could have really imagined at that time. So he was coming up with some uh, really good ideas, but wasn't really proposing them too seriously. This was just kind of an afterthought in the very last chapter of his book, Principles of Physical Geology, we saw there at the very beginning of the, uh, of the lecture. So it ended with a chapter on continental drift and basically proposing that, yeah, if it was going to happen, this is how it could maybe sort of happen. But as a very well-respected geologist, he didn't want to get too on board with that old um, discredited idea of continental drift. So the idea, going back to uh, Wegener, would start to be rejuvenated, uh, rejuvenated in the 1950s. Um, so continental drift began to, you know, aside from just Holmes mentioning a convection in his uh, book, continental drift began to uh, be re re revived. Um, and that happened with the discovery of paleomagnetism and the science of paleomagnetism, um, also by some British folks at University of Cambridge and the Imperial College. So they found out that, um, and you know, we understand this today, and this is a big, you know, uh, thing to study today because we think we're due for a, a, a pole shift soon uh, in the next thousand years or so, perhaps. Um, but the uh, magnetic pole of the Earth has been in the South; it hasn't always been in the North. Um, and right now, it's not like at the North Pole either. It's like hovering around Canada. It's you know never exactly at the poles really, but you know it's somewhere in the north versus somewhere in the south. So uh, our map here is showing us, or our drawing of the uh, uh, Mid-Ocean Ridge is showing us uh, the S, and this is showing us that the polar, uh, um, the magnetic pole is to the south during the formation of this rock. And the reason why we can tell that is because Oceanic crust contains a lot of iron-bearing minerals. Iron, of course, is magnetic. So those minerals actually orient themselves with respect to that current magnetic pole. So as we are able to sample these, we find out that um, you know, it, you know, the, the rock right at the ridge is showing us one thing. It's actually showing us north, of course, because that's what we're seeing today. But anyway, as we uh, get further and further away, we get a pattern, kind of like a uh, like a you know, UPC, uh, you know, like on your, uh, you know, that you would swipe in the uh, grocery store or whatever, right? So we get a pattern. It doesn't, you know, it's not that the seafloor spreading is being caused by the magnetic reversal or vice versa. There's really no cause and effect here. The point is, is that we have a pattern. It could be anything. It could be, you know, the age of, uh, of um, uh, plankton that settles down on the seafloor which actually is a factor too, we can look at that. But anyway, um, it, you know, so we have a pattern where we see that the rock on this side was formed at the same time and by the same event as the rock on this side. And we go further and further out. So this would begin to confirm ideas of seafloor spreading. Also at the same time, um, 
back when Britain uh, was colonizing uh, India. So we had uh, some Western scientists doing research on um, on uh, Indian rocks. Um, they found that, yeah, India had largely been covered by glaciers in the past. So that confirmed that India had been in the Southern Hemisphere along with Antarctica um, and you know, so that was, uh, so we're beginning to see even after Wagner died, unfortunately, long after Wagner died, that uh, we're pulling together some evidence that would mean that, oh boy, yeah, maybe continents could move and maybe we're starting to find out how they could have moved. And then as we go down to this lower image, um, we see the, the, the colors are showing us the ages of the rock. So, oh, here's Iceland, which is split by the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And as we go down, this black line in the middle that's outlined by red and orange, that's the very youngest rock. So that rock is forming right now and has been over the last 20 million years. As we go out to yellow and green, we're getting into older rock dating to about 120 million years old. Again, on either side, so we have a mirror image there at our ridge system. Them, and then it's getting older and older as we go out. And then as we get to the blue, which is right up against uh, the east coast of North America and the west coast of Africa and part of uh, uh, Europe here, we're seeing that uh, we have rock that's about 180 million years old. And this tells us that Pangaea, you know, because as we accept this idea now, um, split apart about 180 million years ago, and that's uh, when the Atlantic Ocean began to form. So the very oldest rock in the Atlantic Ocean uh, shows us the time um, that Pangaea began to break apart. Um, so that's pretty neat. So the oldest rock in the Atlantic is against the continents. Uh, again, there's no subduction here. This is you know, the middle of the plate, the edge of the plate would be all the way over on the west coast and the other edge of the North American plate, of course, is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So this isn't the edge of a plate. This is just um, a passive plate margin where um, off the coast of the, uh, off the east coast, we just have a nice gradual, you know, continental slope down to the sea. There's no tectonic activity going on here. Though that may change in the next few uh, tens of millions of years. Uh, subduction zone is thought to uh, what will we'll probably develop there. Um, okay, so that gets us into the 60s then. So by 1959, continental drift hypothesis is kind of back on the scene. Um, so geologists' minds were actually starting to change quite a bit, and especially in the United Kingdom, because so much of this research with uh, uh, Arthur Holmes and, and others were beginning to find this evidence out firsthand. It would take a little bit longer to kind of bleed over to the United States. Um, in 1964, a very important year for a lot of things happening in British culture as well as, well as science, obviously, the Royal Society uh, held a symposium on uh, continental drift and the fact that it is possible we can actually uh, come up with a mechanism by which continents could move. So we combine continental drift with seafloor spreading, and this would create the science of plate tectonics. Continental drift just wasn't a very good name because the continents, well, they're not the only things moving, the seas are moving too, and they're not drifting, they're being driven by heat. So continental drift isn't the best name for it because of the discovery of seafloor spreading and how dynamic the oceans are and what's going on even deeper than the oceans into the mantle. Uh, plate tectonics is a much better name and we'll see a uh, drawing of those plates in a bit. Um, but I have uh, some images here that are kind of showing us a lot of things going on in the 60s. So uh, going from left to right, we have uh, just a bunch of little you know, sam a sampler of the swinging 60s of uh, London. And there's plenty of movies you can watch that kind of um, give you an idea of what you know uh, things were like back in the 60s, but a lot of crazy things happening. Um, one of which is basically the first supermodel, uh, a woman named Twiggy. Um, and uh, we uh, also, she's showing off uh, some 60s style here, um, kind of a, a dress that is, you know, short, so kind of looks like a baby doll dress, youthful, easy to move around in. So women were, you know, kind of getting away from more constricting, you know, conservative clothing, going back to, you know, baby doll colors and patterns and wearing things that were showing a lot of leg. Uh, so the mini skirts invented. And so we have all these kind of fun, more youthful uh, designs going on. Um, the Beatles, of course, 1964 is a huge year for them because they make their big trip to 
uh, the United States and start to become really, really popular. So they're on uh, the uh, Ed McMahon show, I believe. Um, and um, they, you know, of course, so this is the beginning of the British invasion, invasion of um, uh, popular music. Uh, and then this is a, a, a Time Magazine cover. Of course, Time Magazine is uh, American, but this whole article in here is talking about London, the swinging city, basically how cool London is during the 1960s and how it's like at the forefront of um, uh, mod uh, culture uh, during that time. So the 60s were a huge time for progress uh, with culture. Uh, another thing that was going on too, women's rights were really uh, uh, taking off. Women were able to, um, and we're still waiting on this in the United States, but they fought and got um, you know, equal pay in uh, in the United Kingdom. We're still working on that, but uh, you know that happened in the actually I think that was seventy three. Uh, the birth control pill uh, becomes available and eventually becomes available to non married women. Ooh, that's a big deal. And it first became available, uh, only married women were allowed to get it. Um, but then that changed. So we have women being able to control their futures and not just going right into a life of um, you know, marriage and, um, and motherhood. They're you know, able to work. They're able to have careers. Um, and we kind of take this for granted today, men, women, we kind of take it for granted that we can kind of do whatever we want. Um, but when it comes to women, the birth control pill, more than probably anything else, allowed that to, to happen um, and allow women to become more independent, which is very special. So a uh, huge time for progress, uh, culturally, uh, sexually, I guess, you know, the sexual revolution and all that. And of course, with geology. Um, so 60s in England, really cool stuff going on. Oh, let's go back to the United States. So we're going to go back a little bit in time and get into um, uh, some really cool discoveries that were happening during World War II. So we're talking about another brilliant guy, Harry Hess. Um, he's the one who died in 1969, only about uh, 63 years of age, unfortunately. But um, he was a, uh, an officer during World War II, and he was trained as a geologist. Uh, he was um, assigned to a uh, attack transport ship that had a new special technology, sonar. So um, he, one of the things that they were doing is they were looking for German U-boats, you know, so sonar was very helpful for that. Um, he actually, as a geologist, he was tracking the travel routes too um, to see, you know, if there were U-boats hiding and stuff like that. So he was constantly using the ship's echo sounder, sonar, and um, this allowed him to collect all these ocean profiles across, not the Atlantic, we already have an idea of what's happening in the Atlantic, across the Pacific. So he discovers something really huge, and that is the, um, the East Pacific Rise, which is the fastest spreading ridge in the world, much faster than what's happening in the Atlantic. So he's mapping out all these ocean profiles, figuring out that, okay, we've got this huge mountain system in the Pacific, and then it gets lower and lower, but any hills, any, you know, things are pretty much echoed, kind of like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, where we have a mirror image uh, on either side of the ridge system. So figuring out the rift system there. Uh, what is that mountain system though? What's, what's going on? Well, uh, he, he didn't really know. Um, and it wouldn't really be until he submitted his maps and other explorers did too, to a woman named Marie Tharp. So over here, um, we're looking at Marie Tharp and um, uh, her boss, Bruce Heason, who um, kind of discounted a lot of the things she was saying, but Marie Tharp is one of those unsung heroes of geology that I hope we learn more and more about um, as time passes. You know, if, um, someone has to be dead for I think 50 years before we're like, oh, uh, let's let's uh, celebrate them, let's make a movie about them or a documentary or something like that. And Marie Tharp is one of those people uh, due for it for sure. So this woman has uh, mapped more of the Earth's surface than anyone ever before or than anyone ever will. Um, and she was not allowed on the ships because you can't have a woman on a ship because it's bad luck. Glad that changed, but you know, she, she couldn't be out on the boat. Um, and she wanted to, she wanted to explore. She wanted to see what's going on in the oceans, but she may have 
been better off uh, in the office where she was because as the men came back, they brought her all these um, ocean profiles like this one, which is from one of the publications by her and Bruce Heason. So we have all these ocean profiles. This is basically what the dudes would bring back. She would take that and make sense of it and put it on a map and make a map of the ocean floor. For the first time, we could see what the oceans look like uh, without water in them, and she allowed that to happen. Um, she felt like this was beginning to show evidence of continental drift, and again, this is going back to more like a, you know early 60s, uh, late 50s, so we're going back before it's very well accepted, becoming well accepted by the United Kingdom in 64 and so on. So we're going back a little bit where it was not well accepted. And um, so as she was thinking about, hey, this is how continental drift could have happened, uh, Bruce Heason made fun of her. He referred to it as girl talk, like basically, you know, women don't know anything about geology. They're just talking about stupid stuff. And um but uh, when another paper came in by another geologist that had uh, an outline of all the earthquake epicenters, so all the locations where earthquakes actually happened, and she laid that map on top of her map that she had made, the earthquakes lined up perfectly with the Mid-Atlantic Ridge system, meaning that there's something big going on there, and it's not just a bunch of mountains. These are active. There's something going on. There's plates moving and shifting. There's melt. There's volcanism. There's all this crazy stuff. That's seafloor spreading. So um, she's you know, hopefully becoming much more celebrated, but... You know, um, so she and he's in published basically this, a map of uh, the sea floor with the water removed. Uh, first time anyone had seen anything like that. So we have our Mid-Atlantic Ridge uh, system, and I'll kind of take a red pen and outline it a bit. Goes all the way up through here, cuts through Iceland, and continues down. I'm not going to continue because you can see it pretty well. And we also have, you know, aside from just the obvious spreading, uh, where South America, again, looks like it fits in pretty well to Africa, you know, North America and Europe, a little less so, but, you know. Um, but we also have some faults that are going side to side. These are transform faults. So not only do we have spreading apart or divergent plate boundaries, we also have side to side movements of a transform fault because stress needs to be released. Um, this isn't a flat surface, obviously. This is more or less a sphere. So that kind of happens. Now what Harry Hess was looking at though, uh, working in the Pacific theater of World War II, he was seeing evidence of the East Pacific rise. So that's down here, a very fast moving rift system where now we're looking at rates of uh, about five, six inches per year of motion uh, spreading these apart. So um, the Southern part of the Pacific Ocean is spreading. Uh, much faster than the Atlantic Ocean spreading. Um, and as this is happening though, it, it could be easy to think, oh, okay, isn't the earth getting bigger than if we have all this spreading happening? Well, on the opposite end, and I think you're probably wondering what the heck is happening to South America. Boy, it's being squished from both sides. What could South America possibly be doing to deal with that? South America is growing mountains. So on this side, on the, off the west coast of South America, we have a plate diving down below uh, the west coast of South America and it's creating the Andes Mountains. This is a subduction zone or a convergent plate boundary. So three different kinds of plate boundaries here. Divergent, and that's our rift systems and our ridges. Transform, just relieving some stress. Lots of earthquakes, but no volcanoes there. And then subduction zones, where we have uh, oceanic crust, because it's heavier, it's denser, always sinking down below other crust, perhaps continental, often oceanic. And as it's doing that, it's forming volcanoes, it's forming mountains um, on the continental rock. Um, when it happens, and to go back to talking about the Challenger Deep, and we'll go back to another Challenger namesake in a little bit, the Glomar Challenger, um, here we have the very oldest edge, this is rock getting about 200 million years old, the oldest oceanic crust on Earth, all the way over here in the Northwest Pacific. And it's very old, it's very dense, it's very cold, so it's sinking down below the Mariana Islands. This is Guam here in the, um, you know, in the uh, West Pacific. And so this is the Marianas Trench, this is the Challenger Deep, the very deepest part of the ocean floor right about here as we have a subducting plate, not subducting under a continent, but subducting another under another oceanic crust. So it's really driving down 
and making creating the deepest point in the earth that we or in the earth, in the oceanic crust that we know of. So anyway, that's a I know that's a little overview of like that's just like plate tectonics uh, in a nutshell. But uh, to kind of continue developing the idea, so in 1960, then Hess um, made a, a huge. Um, um, uh, you know, uh, innovation in that he, um, uh, let's see what we're doing here. Okay. So now with the Glomar Challenger, so that's what this is <clears throat> named after the HMS Challenger. It's really nice. They kept all the same names that, uh, Sir Charles Wyville Thompson used back in the 1870s. Now here we are almost a hundred years later with another ship, another Challenger, that is going to try to find out the ages of rock on either side of the spreading ridge. So it's uh, sampling rock from all over the place and confirms that they indeed are younger, closer to the ridge, and they get older further and further away from the ridge. This is basically the, and we hesitate to use this word, this is basically the proof though that Harry Hess needs. Now as an older fella, um, teaching and talking about uh, convection. So he's adapting that idea that, that Arthur Holmes had about convection in the mantle that would drive these plates and actually create seafloor spreading and use that to push continents apart and not just continents but push oceans around too. So that's a kind of plate tectonics in a nutshell then is we have um, heat deep in the mantle that is rising up it's shoving around other rock primarily continents causing them to bump into each other um, slide past one another all these sort of things and doing all the stuff that alfred wegener found evidence for but now we actually have a mechanism we can actually explain how um uh, plates could move. So it's not just continents again, it's plates. So I like this map because as geologists, we need to start to think about, um, you know, we don't just see a map and say, like, oh, there's North America. Oh, there's Kentucky. There's about where my house is. Or there's, a, you know, the, this continent and this continent and this continent. We need to look at a map like this, where we're uh, defining each individual plate. So we have these huge plates that make up the Earth's crust. And, um, and the crust is made up of two parts, continental rock and oceanic, crust, and oceanic rock. So the oceanic crust is heavier, denser. The uh, continental crust is made up of granite and is actually lighter weight and thicker than the oceanic crust. Um, and the movement of all this stuff is you know, causing continents to move. So, um, and oceans to move too. But again, Wagner, going all the way back to uh, ideas of continental drift, didn't know anything about what's happening in the oceans, really. He only had evidence from continental rocks. So continental drift is really just going to be based on what the continents are doing. He couldn't even really imagine what the oceans were doing all that much, though he did sort of propose an idea of seafloor spreading had no evidence for it though. Then once we actually find evidence that, hey, yeah, it's the oceans doing this stuff. We have volcanism in the oceans that are creating brand new oceanic rock and is acting as a conveyor belt to shove around all the continental rock. And that's what's causing what appears to be continental drift. Well, that brings us to our whole plate tectonic idea. So uh, to kind of show what's important about this image here is uh, the plates are not continents okay so there's nowhere on earth where there's an individual continent saudi arabia, saudi arabia might be an, an exception there where there's an individual continent moving around independently of all the stuff around it moving through the ocean and stuff like that it really doesn't happen every continent has some oceanic crust at attached to it in fact there are some tectonic plates the Pacific's a great example that have no continent at all. It's all oceans. So basically taking that old idea of continental drift and understanding that things are way deeper, way bigger, and way slower than Wagner was imagining brings us to plate tectonic theory. Um, so the earth is split into these big plates that contain both oceanic and continental crust, and those things are moving by heat deeper in the earth and into the mantle. So back to uh, the Challenger Deep.
This is a cross-section of the Mariana Arc, the Marianas Trench, which the Challenger Deep is the uh, deepest point in. So now we have an understanding of how that happens. So we have a subduction zone where we have, oh, here's some, some spreading going on because Southeast Asia, as far as tectonics go, has a lot going on, which is why you hear about frequent earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Oh, Krakatoa just erupted the other day. That's cool. It's... <laughs> So uh, yeah, things are going on, uh, Krakatoa in Indonesia, it's wild stuff. Um, but anyway, you hear about so many earthquakes and volcanic eruptions happening here because there's a lot of tectonic activity. Um, but we have a subduction zone where we have this old, cold, this rock is about 200 million years old here, um, oceanic crust, and it's so old and cold and dense, and it's sinking below other oceanic crust, which is also quite uh, dense. And so it's driving very, very deep and uh, forming the deepest point in the earth. Again, deeper than um, if you inverted Mount Everest and tried to stick it in here, uh, you'd have a lot of space left over. So crazy stuff. Um, so Challenger then lends its name to, um, even though back then they were starting to only kind of begin to come up with ideas of seafloor spreading, Challenger Deep itself is actually a really good example of the other side of that, the subduction zone that kind of makes this whole thing go full circle where we have oceanic crust being created at spreading ridges and we have oceanic crust being destroyed and subducted back down and remelted at subduction zones, creating these big convection cells more or less that Arthur Holmes had uh, had uh, talked about. So um, anyway, that's uh, basically it for uh, uh, my talk on plate tectonics. Plate tectonics was such a huge deal, every bit as important to our field of earth science and geology as the idea of evolution is to um, biology or the idea of gravity is to physics. So this is our major um, unifying theory, which means it ties together so many things that were thought at one time to be unrelated. It ties a whole bunch of stuff together. Uh, plate tectonics uh, represents a paradigm shift in the earth sciences. Um, a few things that this means is for a while, geology was thought to be largely an observational science. Hard data is for fields like chemistry and physics. Geologists just observe. Plate tectonics blew that out of the water. We've got data. We can collect data. We can go out and get numbers and do statistical analysis and make predictions based on you know what we understand and see how that holds up. This enabled geology to become, I don't want to say a hard versus soft science because I think those terms are are horrible and um, you know not uh, never accurate anyway. But this really kind of made geology become in a lot of ways, a much more respected field way up there with things like physics and chemistry, whose uh, you know, proponents were like you know, da Vinci and Galileo and people going all the way back. Now we've got a major theory, a major unifying theory based on physical laws of nature for geology. And that's huge. And it's so recent, 60s, 70s. I had a, a professor at WKU who said that when he was in graduate, and he was a little older, when he was in graduate school, he had professors in geology that were not on board with plate tectonics in the 80s. Um, and that's, uh, you know, it's amazing how recent that is. But hey, this is our, um, you know, apple uh, hit in the head moment, right? If that actually happened to Newton, I don't know. But, you know, this is this is it for geology, which is very exciting. And anyway, so there's a, a link here um, that's, uh, uh, I thought was uh, very helpful, talked about um, and actually has pictures of and you know, uh, quotes from a lot of the guys who were doing research back in the 60s and 70s and developing ideas that are, you know, making us understand plate tectonics more and more all the time, just like physicists and astronomers are still trying to understand gravity, how gravity works and all that. We're still doing the same thing with plate tectonics. Biologists are still doing the same thing with uh, evolution. Sure, it's never going to end. I hope, I hope we always have more to explore. Um, but I like this uh, quote down here, only when we began to ask the, the right questions did the answers begin to appear, because that's what science is about. You know, I'm trying to give you a bunch of facts and stuff that I know. Okay, and there's some basic information you want to know in order to go out and be a scientist and to understand uh, stuff. But um, it's more about asking questions. Um, 
it's more about asking questions than it is about having the right answers. Uh, asking questions that take you down uh, new paths that right now you can't even imagine. Um, and that's, that's how progress takes place, not by sitting here knowing a bunch of stuff, but by exploring and finding out things that, um, that we don't know. What is the unknown? And uh, what are some answers we, we want to get in the future? Um, so anyway, that's uh, Play Tectonics. We uh, covered a few different areas here, went to Germany, went to the United States, talked about some people in all those uh, places, but um, we're focusing on the United Kingdom as being some of the, uh, the heart and soul of the major discoveries that would lead us to our big unifying theory in geology. So um, go ahead and watch the Ian Stewart Men of Rock uh, video uh, called Moving Mountains, and I'll have that link to you right along with us. And um, that's great and really gets into another guy called Edward Bailey, um, as well as, uh, you know, uh, Peach and Horn and uh, Murchison, you know, that we've already talked about as far as discovering the highlands and stuff. Uh, a little bit of a Hutton, because you can't talk about Scottish geology without talking about Hutton. Um, and actually, he did come up with ideas of like horizontal motions, uh, you know, may have formed mountains you know, even 100, uh, 100, 200 years before plate tectonics was developed, really, seriously. Um, and um, yeah, so some really uh, cool stuff there, as well as uh, Arthur Holmes towards the end, and of course, quite a bit about uh, uh, Sir Charles Wyville Thompson. So anyway, thanks a lot, guys. I hope you enjoy that, um, <clears throat> and I hope you really enjoy the video of Ian Stewart, because um, he's it's way more interesting than I can do. Um, so thanks a lot, and I hope you guys have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Have a good, um, enjoy. <laughs>